Okay, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to call this meeting to order here on Tuesday, August the 17th, with the ringing of our rotary bell. At this time, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Connor Jarvis uh, to lead us in the, in, in the invocation. Is he in the I don't think he's on yet. yet. Uh huh. Is he in the waiting room or? No. No, he is. All right. He's coming on. He should be on now. Good afternoon, Mr. Connor. I'd like to invite you to lead us in our invocation today. You are on silence. There you go, you hear me? We can. All right, apologies. My pleasure, thank you, Mr. President Steve. Hello all and happy Tuesday. Uh, today's invocation comes from uh, uh, a daily reading from Zig Ziglar that uh, I thought was, was timely and, and I'd like to share. So um, it goes, Thomas Edison accomplished more in his lifetime than 10 average men or women do, I'll add that. Uh, his contribution to modern society is almost impossible to measure. He invented the phonograph, the electric locomotive, the microphone, uh, a method for constructing concrete buildings, didn't know that one, uh, a device for producing sheet metal, a telegraph signal box, and of course, the incandescent electric lamp. What is the quality in one individual that enables him to make such a mammoth contribution to society? Is it genius? Is it opportunity? Is it fate? We may never know all the answers to these questions, but we do know something about the work of Thomas Edison. He worked long hours. He had the ability to concentrate, to focus all of his mind, body, and soul on one particular project until it was completed to his satisfaction. The ability to concentrate was an essential ingredient in the success of Thomas Edison. When he was working on a project, he put the blinders on and concentrated solely on that project. He developed tunnel vision and permitted no distractions. His persistence was legendary. He performed over 10,000 experiments before he produced the first incandescent light, 10,000. What about you and your project or, or our own projects? Do we have goals that we're able to put our whole mind, body, and spirit into? So with that, I'd just like to close in prayer and say, uh, just Lord, Father God, please grant us the strength, perseverance, and concentration to overcome the challenges that we face as a club, uh, united together as Rotarians with a common purpose. Help us put on our blinders, permit no distractions, and allow no obstacles to stop us from being uh, a servant light to our friends, our families, our colleagues, and our, our workplaces, communities, and the world. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Connor, for those encouraging words about Mr. Edison. Now, if you would join me, I'm actually going to stand, but I'd like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with justice for all. Liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now, um, I would like to invite Mr. Doug Cole as our greeter. Do we have any visitors here today, Doug, besides Miss Carla? Four-way test, Steve. Do the, do the four-way test. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> all right, our four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it, Is it fair, fair to, to all concerned? concerned? Will, will build, it build goodwill, goodwill and, and better, better friendships? friendships? Will it be, will it be beneficial? beneficial to all, all concerned? Concerned. All right, Mr. Doug. I am uh, reviewing what I can see on the screen. I'm not seeing any guests today. Do we have any guests? And I don't see anything in the chat room. Um, am I missing somebody? Are there any, do we have any guests? Yeah. 
If not, then uh, I turn it back over to President Steve. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Do we happen to have any Rotary ambassadors this last week? Anybody visit any other clubs? It's been a pretty inactive week. No guess. I guess, no I, guess it, I guess it has. Okay. Well, thank you. Mr. Connor, you are still on mute, my brother. Struggling today. I'm trying to prevent Cheryl from having to mute me all the time. And uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm muting myself at the wrong time. So, all right. Well, let me jump right into our Akron Rotary History Minute for the week, followed by our What's Happening announcement. So uh, this Akron Rotary History Minute takes us back to Rotary year 1916 to 1917, where George W. Billow was our Rotary Club's president. And George was our very own near and dear uh, and beloved friend, Thane Billow's great, great uncle, George recruited Thane's great-great-grandfather, Charles, and thus began the storied history of the Billow family membership in the Akron Rotary Club. I guess you could say the Billows have certainly paid their dues throughout the years. Uh, when the Rotary Camp was founded in the early 1920s, I, I found this anecdote interesting. The Billow Funeral Home would use their limousines and company vehicles to transport children to and from the camp. So, Thane, thank you to you and the family for, for all you guys have done for the camp throughout uh, and, and, and our club throughout the, the many, many years. And to uh, uh, President George W. Billow for his service back in the Rotary year 1916 to 1917. What was happening around the United States at the time? Well, Woodrow Wilson was our president. Gas was 31 cents per gallon. A postage stamp cost four cents. Uh, I don't know about you guys now. I, I don't even tend to pick that, uh, bend down to pick up a quarter off the ground. Uh, that, that could be because I'm a germ phobe in some ways, but uh, just you know, four cents for postage and we won't even pick up quarters these days. The average price of a house was between $600 and $4,500. So talk about the size of those jumbo loans back then. My goodness, uh, homes were, were much more affordable, it seems. So uh, around the world, a pretty significant year. World War I was full on and would continue until November 11th of 20, uh, I'm sorry, of 1918. So World War I, we were, we were fully in the thick of that. Germany used Zeppelins to terrorize the English and French countryside. Uh, they were unsuccessful in cities, though. Uh, Germany made their first proposal of surrender to the Allied nations in that year. The Boy Scouts of America were granted a congressional charter. Walter Cronkite, the famous newscaster, was born in November of 1916, and JFK was born in May of 1917, so still within that same rotary year. Uh, the National Parks Service was founded. The Boston Red Sox won the World Series in 1916, beating the Brooklyn Robins four games to one. Uh, unfortunately, and, and this is uh, in no small part my opinion, they would win, against, uh, win again in 1918 against the Chicago Cubs. But thankfully, thereafter, they would not win again for 84 years thanks to the curse of the Bambino. Go Yankees, got to throw that in there. And uh, the Montreal Canadiens won the Stanley Cup. So that is what happened around the world in the 1916 to 1970 Rotary year, uh, which was again, uh, George W. Billow's year as our fine Rotary Club's president. Now what's happening, uh, what's happening around Akron or what's happening Akron. So uh, what we've got is again, we've mentioned this a few times, but the Akron Art Museum has their bold color in the 19s, 1980s exhibit still going on. It's free on Friday and Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. That runs through September 19th. So a phenomenal exhibit. Encourage you guys to check that out. Friday, August 20th, uh, 2021. Obviously, that's the year we're in. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading the year. Uh, the Stan Hewitt Gala Speak Easy. Uh, and, and this Stan Hewitt's annual big event, it's being co-hosted by our own Pat O'Neill uh, and his lovely wife, Sarah. I, I might be incorrect. Maybe it's co-host isn't the right term. It might be uh, co-chair. Uh, but they are co-chairing the event this year. And again, it's Friday, August 20th. So this coming Friday, there's going to be dinner dancing and prohibition inspired spirits 
So contact Stan Hewitt for tickets if you want to support Pat and Sarah and just a, a phenomenal cause and evening at Stan Hewitt. On Saturday, August 21st, Highland Square's having their Porch Rocker event. There's going to be 160 bands from all over performing on porches throughout Highland Square. The event's free. It's all an all-day event, so uh, hopefully we have some nice weather and you can enjoy some great music out in Highland Square. On Sunday, August 22nd, so a lot coming up here this week, uh, Romantic Brahms at Blossom Music Center is happening from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. I know I mentioned this a few weeks ago. As Steve's mentioned it a couple of times. We still have 16 free tickets left for interested folks. Uh, and if you are interested, please contact Steve Bowie or Cheryl Warren. Uh, might be a nice time for us to have some outdoor fellowship as a club for, for those that are able to go. Uh, and again, that's Sunday, August 22nd at Blossom. Then on Saturday, August 28th, so a week from this coming Saturday, we actually have two club events. So I'm excited to say we actually have some events coming up as a club, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. We have Kenmore Cleanup Day. It's a club service project. We're going to be picking up trash cans uh, or trash, uh, sorry, trash cans and bottles. Uh, Keeping Akron Beautiful is going to be working with the Kenmore Community Development Corporation and Tina Boys. Uh, the meeting location, 952 Kenmore Boulevard, and we're actually going to be co-laboring with members from Akron's 100 Black Men, as well as members from Goss Memorial Church in Kenmore. So uh, Keep Akron Beautiful is also going to be having one of their trucks there as well. So it should be a great service project on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, and the same day, from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m., we've got the annual Cornhole Tournament which is going to be benefiting the Rotary Camp for children with special needs. All proceeds are going to be benefiting our wonderful camp. So that's what's happening around town here on August 17th, 2021. Busy couple of weeks coming up, and, and hopefully we can uh, partake as club members in some of those events. Back to you, Steve. Hey, thank you, Connor. And hey, just a quick question. Uh, I know you had, uh, you had contacted COVID, uh, even though you had been vaccinated, and uh, here we are two weeks later. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the rest of your story? Yeah, no, see, absolutely. No, appreciate you asking, guys. I am 100% better back at it. I was back at it in the office uh, last week and, and felt very fortunate. My symptoms never progressed past just uh, regular cold symptoms. So um, never got worse, never had a fever, um, you know, just usual cold symptoms. And uh, my taste and smell did go away for about five days, but those are those are fully back. So my, my joke was, you know, I, I was hoping I wasn't going to be craving sweets while I wasn't feeling well. Well, even though I couldn't taste or smell, I was still eating ice cream and doing all that stuff. So I did not come away losing any weight. <laughs> if, uh, you know, so I, I did not lose any weight after my bout with COVID. But Steve, um, 100% better back at it felt great last week too. And, uh, you know, followed all the protocols with my quarantine period. But uh, thankfully, it was a very mild case. And, uh, you know, again, take for take it as you will. But uh, I'd like to think the vaccine played a part in that for sure. So I'm glad to hear that you're back and up on your feet and feeling well. So um, Miss Katie Miller, you should have a little bit of an insider's take on Porch Rocker. And uh, love to hear you talk about that for a second. So Porch Rocker is really quite amazing. It's a grassroots uh, music festival and people in different quadrants of Highland Square it rotates every year, volunteer their front porches for live entertainment and they stagger them every two hours. So on each street in my quadrant neighborhood, and I posted the website for Porch Rocker so you can go get the map and you can print off the flyer which gets you free um, uh, transport on the Metro bus number one that drops you right off in Highland Square. Um, it's advised you don't drive into Highland Square. There's over 15,000 pedestrians walking around, and so it's very difficult to navigate, and there's no parking. But if you want some free entertainment, there's lots of food trucks. There's music from acoustic to rock to whatever you could possibly imagine. There's going to be yoga. There's vendors. There's silent disco at Mustard Seed Market on Saturday night after that's over. So um, again, if you go to the website that I posted in the chat, you can learn more about it. But if the weather's nice, it's great. Bring a water bottle that you can refill. Um, they have water stations and a camp chair if you want to sit. Other than that, it's a good day. And I, I'll, be, I'll be home. I'll be back in Akron. I'll be in my neighborhood. I have my grandson. We will probably be outside. So if you see me, um, I put my address in the, in the chat. Feel free to stop by and say hi. Hey, thoughts or recommendations on parking? As you said, um, there's going to be <clears> 50, park at the, You can people. park at the um, Red Cross building on West Market Street. 
Um, they have um, a shuttle set up from there. And again, there's more information on the website that I posted about suggested parking areas. But I knew, I do know the American Red Cross building is staging a, a parking area for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments. I know that Connor had mentioned that coming up on this Sunday, we still have 14 tickets, free tickets to Blossom Music Center uh, with Romantic Brahms. And that begins at seven o'clock. And by the way, if you went to purchase these tickets, you'd be spending $25 a ticket. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to bring someone who might be uh, interested in possibly coming to Rotary or just taking your spouse uh, or a significant other. But uh, let's not let these pass. And uh, Laura Smiley and her radio station, The Summit 95.5, was very, very gracious to uh, give us all of these free tickets. So if you're interested, you can put your hand up in the chat and uh, I'll see that you get some tickets. Additionally, August the 28th, as Connor mentioned, not this coming Saturday, but a couple of Saturdays in, in the future here, um, we have two wonderful service opportunities. One of them is uh, the Cornhole Tournament going on at the camp. And that's been a big hit since Scott Culligan started it, I believe somewhere around eight years ago. And uh, all of the proceeds from people having fun playing cornhole all of them go to support our wonderful Rotary Camp. So that's going to be taking place. Uh, doors open at 8.30. I think competition starts at 9.30. And it takes up until about 2 o'clock for them to be able to crown a champion. So uh, those who would be interested in just having a day of fun in the sun, uh, August the 28th, doors opening at 8.30. Um, competition beginning at 9.30. Secondly, this other opportunity is a golden opportunity for us to be out and about and doing what we do best, Rotarians, which is to serve the greater community. And uh, Tina Boys, who is actually in process of uh, becoming a member of our club, has been heading up the Community Development Corporation there in Kenmore for the last four and a half years and doing an outstanding job. And if you've not been in Kenmore recently, I would encourage you to take a drive through because there is a lot of life that is springing up, a lot of wonderful things that are happening. But we have, we have partnered with 100 Black men. Michael Irby, who heads up uh, that organization, is bringing some of his folks, as well as Goss Memorial Church uh, right there in Kenmore. Are gonna bring, uh, they will be bringing some of their folks. And I'd like to see... I'd like to see if we could get a turnout about 10 of our Rotarians for two hours because we're simply going to be picking up garbage along Kenmore Boulevard and then kind of spreading out into the uh, adjoining neighborhoods and looking to involve some of the local residents and taking responsibility for stepping up, as it were, uh, the health and, and the wholeness of, of the Kenmore community. So uh, if you can make that, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can let, you can let uh, our service uh, leaders know, either Cindy Kane or Christina Horak, but that's going to be Saturday on the 28th, 9 to 11. And let me say, yes, we do have a couple of events that are kind of competing, but really they're not competing when you look at how big our club is and uh, where people might like to uh, throw their efforts in. So... Without any other further ado, is anybody happy today? Miss Carla, are you happy? Yes, I'm time. going to. Whatever you'd like I'm to share. Happy. I am choosing happy, right? In the midst of the storm, we have those choices and we're going to choose happy. <laughs> love it, love it. Mr. Jack Herrick. Yes, Vivian and I are happy because Children's Service, Children's Hospital, and uh, Jeff Kempf and his wife have stepped up to lead a fundraising program to help St. Damien's Hospital in uh, Haiti due to the hurricane. The, 
hospital was not damaged this time, but they are taking a lot of inflow and are going to need a lot of support. Vivian and I have not had time to decide what we're going to do, but it's going to be substantial. And we would urge all of our Rotarians to participate as well as they can. Uh, the funds are, can be sent to Children's Hospital. There's an article in the Beacon Journal this morning in the lower right-hand uh, first page. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else happy? Susan. Yeah, I'm happy for Jack's announcement. Jack, thank you so much. We, I will get a check or whatever needs to go. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that we're going to do something about Katie. It's just disastrous to know, you know, what their lives are like at this point. I'm also happy because Steve uh, had successful carpal tunnel surgery on Monday. And so he's doing well and is very, very pleased with it. So for that, we are grateful. So I will send in five bucks for today. Anybody else happy today? Cheryl. Yes, well, I'm happy to see my old friend Carla Chapman here today. Carla, welcome again. And uh, I too, Jack, I'm pleased that you mentioned everything about Haiti. Um, there will be uh, some more information coming out from the district about that as well. Uh, an email went out just before this meeting that I think Larry is now going to turn into um, some correspondence for all of us. And um, it, it is a tremendous effort that um, I, I think it's great that we can get behind. Um, it's just very sad. And I also am happy, so I'm going to give like 10 happy dollars today because my husband made it back safe and sound with his five best friends and brother uh, from Sturgis. Um, they went to the motorcycle rally. They stayed out of the crowds. <laughs> Um, they came back healthy and they rode um, their motorcycles enough miles to account for our being from Ohio to Florida and back again. <laughs> so they rode a lot of miles in four days, <laughs> um, but I'm glad he's back safe and sound and healthy. Thank you, Cheryl. Anybody else happy that would want to share today? Okay. Um, does the club, anyone here today have any other announcements that they would like to make for all of us? Susan? Yes, I'm really excited because uh, Manny uh, Nunez has started the application to be an exchange student in the year 22-23. And, um, you know, I hope there will be others that will pursue that as well. But um, we are going to have exchanges and we will be able to benefit from the exchanges with students from other countries soon, I hope. Wonderful, thank you. I have, uh, I have one announcement I wanna make. Uh, you can see that our dear Jack Herrig is uh, in the room there with our beloved John Daly. And are you, Jack, are you in uh, John's home? You're on, you're on mute again. Yes, we're in John's home. Uh, I'm gonna try to get his computer up. It's crashed again, but I need somebody who understands Apple. Uh, the only thing I know about Apple computers is they had a bite out of them. And <laughs> we've not been able to get John. I had it up and running and it's crashed again. And it, so if there's help out there, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Jack, for, um, for uh, reaching out to John last week after uh, he shared with the club and that uh, you were able to check on him, see that, we, that he was doing okay. And to uh, 
to help him, uh, you know, get that doctor's appointment set back up. So thank you for, uh, thank you for putting uh, service above self and uh, helping our dear brother, John. So much appreciated. All right, lastly, uh, we've got a few birthdays. Doug, you have something. Yeah, just a quick shout out to our partner with the Rotary Camp, the Akron Area YMCA's 150 year anniversary celebration is this Saturday evening. And uh, uh, 150 years of serving this community is a pretty impressive <laughs> record if I do say so myself. Very impressive, very impressive, thank you. Um, we've got a lot of people in this club born in the month of August. And so we've got a few upcoming birthdays. Yesterday, our beloved uh, Brian Casarco, it was his birthday and he and the family are on vacation now. Um, Michael Shearer has a birthday coming up on Friday. Uh, Marsha Holcomb has a birthday coming up on Saturday. And then... Dr. Rob McGregor and Rick Rogers uh, have birthdays on Sunday, August the 22nd. Additionally, Fred Swartz on the 23rd. And lastly, Lance Kima has a birthday coming up on the 25th. So that's it as far as announcements go. And uh, at this time, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker for today. So we're privileged today to have Ms. Carla Chapman. And Carla, Carla be, began her career with Akron Public Schools back in 1995. And recently she was appointed as the district's chief diversity officer. And she works to promote equity and inclusion across the district with staff and community engagement. Her recent work includes a focus on diversity training and coaching for teachers, school leaders, families, and other professionals. An Akron native, Carla has dedicated her career to advocating for urban families and children. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from The Ohio State University in 1985 and a Master of Arts degree from the University of Akron in 1994. Both degrees in the study of family and consumer science. She holds several other certifications, including social services coordination, divorce and community mediation, adult experiential learning, diversity and trauma training. She's currently pursuing her doctorate in interprofessional leadership with a cultural foundational cognate. In her first job with APS, Carla worked as the Enterprise Community Family Services Liaison for several inner city schools in low income neighborhoods. She coordinated student and family support services, including after school programs, health services, academic interventions, and case management. In 1997, Carla became a social services specialist for the district. She coordinated several local state and federal grant projects serving students in grades K through 12, bringing many organizations together in creative partnership with APS. Then from 2003 to 2009, she became a special projects coordinator in this role. She developed a nationally recognized after school model called Perkins Activities Central. PAC brought community partners together from throughout Summit County to address barriers to academic achievement. Fellow Rotarians and visitors, I am honored to welcome today as our speaker, Ms. Carla Chapman. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Very rich introduction, Steve. I, I don't know if you were elaborating on some things or if I actually sent you that, but at any rate, I always find it very weird to hear people talk about me. <laughs> um, yeah, you start to uh, feel like you're outside your body. I am very honored to be here. Thank you, Katie, for making the connection. I know it's not always easy to run me down. Um, I have running shoes on most days, and Katie made it happen. Truly, she did. 
um, I'm always amazed at the connections that we have with each other in Akron. So from listening to Connor's history, I started, you know, just jotting down all the connections that I have with Rotarians here with the Akron Rotary Club. So of course, Cheryl mentioned our uh, relationship going way back to our service on the Summit County Historical Society and Katie and her husband, Tim, uh, being of service to the Akron Public School District, and of course, Tim approving all of those position changes over the years for me. Um, service with Chip Billow on the uh, Child Guidance and Family Solutions Board. Doug Cole and I have been a part of many working groups over the years, and we've had a very robust partnership with the YMCA, including Doug. Uh, 2,000 youngsters being served by safety around water and learning how to swim and sort of removing that barrier and risk factor for many of our young people who really don't know how to swim. And so been very appreciative of that. And then finally, um, Tina Boys in the Kimmore Neighborhood Development Corporation. Uh, we've worked together going back to her time at the Akron Community Foundation and Mike Irby, 100 Black Men, being a former colleague of the Akron Public Schools and educator. And then Porch Rocker. I have to speak about Porch Rocker because Jody Delamater and her husband playing those ukuleles on their porch might have been my first experience there. So I always tease that in Akron, we're not only collaborative by uh, nature and intentionality, but these are real relationships that we have with people. And where many cities say there's six degrees of separation from knowing folks in their city, I, I really believe and say it all the time, here in Akron, we're two. We're two degrees away from knowing everybody in this city. And, and I've proven it over and over again, many times over the years. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to share uh, some of the new work that we are doing here in the district and now under the leadership of a brand new superintendent. And maybe uh, you might even reach out to her at some point to speak uh, with the Rotary regarding her goals for our district as we move forward into this new leadership era. Um, I'm becoming popular, I think, with Rotary. I was in Cuyahoga Falls, I think, about three weeks ago. So I don't know if you all are talking to each other, but something's going down. <laughs> I had a great time uh, over their lunch meeting there. So I um, want to talk with you about this new work around equity and inclusion. While the position is new for me, the work is not. I mean, my entire career has really been around removing barriers to success for our students and engaging our families in ways that support them in the work as well. And partners who seek to not only at the corporate and institutional level, but grassroots partnerships that, that can be very helpful and supporting our students through mentoring, through offering jobs and opportunities for our students and families, and then in being uh, resources for our students at both the building level and those neighborhood partnerships that we desire and need. Many of you may be aware of our College and Career Academies initiative, which is now moving into middle school. And so our middle school transformation of college and career academies is really going to focus on social emotional learning for those students and community service, which is right up the alley of uh, the Rotary Club. So there may even be an opportunity for you to engage in that work in supporting our young people to learn more about how they can serve our community and not just serve, but how they can solve problems within the communities where they live. And so uh, excited to see how middle school will take shape as our leaders in that work begin. Keep your eyes and ears open for more about that. 
we're starting to do some work at even the elementary level around college and career academies, just introducing careers to our youngest of learners. And so lots going on on that front. But I'm here to talk to you today about the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And believe it or not, I have two slides and I can talk for an hour or more on two slides, but I have learned in this virtual world that the endless showing of PowerPoint slides can, can be tough for people. So um, Cheryl, if you're ready to start with that first slide, we can get going there. And so when we talk about diversity, um, typically folks call me, ask me to present, we want you to talk about diversity. And a lot of times they're really asking me to come and, and, and share what you guys are doing around racial diversity. But I like to always start our conversations with diversity has many dimensions and it goes beyond race, color, ethnicity, um, and really starts to look at all the very unique and different ways we all come to the table that we all present in this world in which we live. And so you'll see in this graphic age as a dimension of diversity. And even here within your own Rotary Club, there is a range of age, which brings different types of experience and knowledge and understanding of our world. Gender as a dimension of diversity, uh, sexual orientation, our religious background, our ability levels, our social economic status, and even where we live moving into the beige our emotional intelligence, understanding how to be more self-aware and managing ourselves and others. The way we communicate is a dimension of diversity. Um, we can talk about the various experiences we have like veteran status, our education level, the way we look and wear our hair, the clothes that we choose. We can talk about our marital status, our time orientation, the way we think about things. There is diversity in thought that we don't always consider, the hobbies. And then moving further out on this graphic, we talk about things that are even uh, more uh, determined by our professional. Status. So we can look at dimensions of diversity around job titles, our, our pay scale, where we work, the union affiliations that we have. And so we always approach diversity in a conversation as a broader topic than just race. And you can really think about how each of these areas intersect. So age and work experience could be an interesting intersection. Um, we can talk to our seniors about the ways in which we worked in our community uh, back in the day uh, when factories were important here and provided opportunities for our families and how we've moved from being the a city of factory work and rubber work to polymer science and social service and corporate headquarters of all kinds. And so we look at this wheel and we draw lines between how diversity interacts across many different dimensions. And so if you can, can see this, clearly enough, would really like to get your thoughts on how this um, resonates with you, what you might think about it. At the last uh, Rotarian meeting in, in the Cuyahoga Falls, one member came up and said, you know, I don't see a dimension around motivation level 
here. And so uh, I like to get that kind of feedback because it helps inform our thinking and we'll soon add that to this will um, to expand these dimensions. But we'd like to get your thoughts, uh, really would love to hear from you on what resonates with you. Anyone? Uh, Rob McGregor has his hand up. I, I really like this. The, the fact that it is so so many dimensions for us to, to consider, uh, it, it really adds a richness. The one piece that as an extreme extrovert, I, I don't see uh, the, you know, that there's is such a, a revelation when I realized that I suck the life out of the room and the introverts are paying the price for that. So I get energy from a crowd and I don't, I don't know where that would fit into this. Ah, I don't know, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if it might have to do with, I don't know, our uh, interactions with others or connections with others. I'm not sure, that's an interesting, take, Rob, thank you for that. The ways in which we interact with others. Yeah, and Carla, I would say that what this diagram does is it shows that there's a tremendous breadth and depth to the whole topic of diversity. And so um, something that we may think we've understood or had some level of understanding is a lot bigger than maybe any of us have actually considered. Yeah, I get that a lot, Steve. Um, and in education, as you look at these various dimensions, we can then start to examine, well, how does race play into the educational opportunities for students? How, our, uh, how are our high school students around their age or grade level experiencing workplace internships and opportunities? I mean, you can really start to draw these lines. How does socioeconomic status affect education for our students or opportunities or does uh, family socioeconomics matter in terms of geography as we think about where services for our students are happening and take place. And so as you get a closer look at this, and I know Cheryl has it and can share uh, as well as Katie Miller, you can really start to note for yourself where the intersections lie uh, for the work that we all really have to do around education. Katie had her hand up. Carla, I really appreciate that um, it highlights the fact that it's just not race. I think most people go right, right away to diversity inclusion is black and white. And clearly in the community that we live in, that's not true with all of our uh, different backgrounds. I'm also wondering, is trauma in there as far as diversity? Some people uh, children will go through their lives having never experienced anything adverse. And we definitely know, and you know, that the families and children that are coming from trauma uh, have to learn and be handled in different ways. Does that fall on that I, on that wheel someplace? Yeah, you know what? I, I would probably tie it, but it's not explicitly stated. I would tie it, though, to life experience, too, um, because we can dissect those life experiences and understand that based on where you live, right, your socioeconomic status, your family makeup and dynamics, that trauma can be experienced, right? Um, and so that's another one to add. You can almost draw little boxes beside or on top of others to get even more specific like life experience and then trauma right or life experience and uh, family breakup right family disruption 
Um, lots of trauma, as you know, Katie, in our district, which is why you'll see our schools becoming more trauma informed. IPS, the I Promise School, is really about being trauma informed, and they're a model for us. So that work is being spread throughout our district. How do we train our staff to be more responsive in understanding what trauma looks like? because trauma doesn't necessarily look like the student that runs into the office, right, in tears and um, is willing to talk and share. It might look like a behavior problem, right? And if we misinterpret the behavior problem as quote unquote, a, a student who's just disruptive and not a student who is traumatized, right? It changes the way we respond. And that's an element of being equitable and inclusive in our work. So when we look at this, we're not just looking at it on the surface, we're doing exactly what you would recommend. Life experience means what? And how does it show up in different ways for students based on who they are, based on where they live and their own life experiences? I don't see any other hands or uh, questions in the chat, Carla. Okay. Thank you for that rich dialogue, folks. I much rather prefer the dialogue versus the lecture style. So on the next slide, wanted to just unpack for you what we mean when we talk about comprehensive education equity. And so we're going to populate this slide here shortly, but let's just start with business engagement. It is one area of comprehensive education equity that could be explored in our district. How do we engage as a business with others to advance equitable opportunities for females, for minority businesses, for LGBTQ plus business operations, maybe within our disabled community or our non-English speaking community. And people don't often think of our schools as a business too. But we probably have every type of business that any corporate organization would have, right? So we have a finance office, we have accountants who work there, we have architects, we have a purchasing and supplier management offices, we have a child nutrition who tend to be dietitians and food service management folks. We have a whole maintenance division that has everything from electricians to carpenters to flooring people. And so people don't often think of our district as a, as a business too. And it is one of those areas of equity that presents an opportunity for us. Can you click again, Cheryl? culturally responsive teaching and family and community engagement. That's fine. These often go together anyway. So you were okay. Um, we talk about culturally responsive teaching because we are such a diverse district. We would want our teachers to understand how to best represent all of the students that we serve in our curriculum, in the programming that is offered in the ways in which our students think about their instruction. How do we leverage and be sure that we're including student voice, that we are making curriculum relevant? And then there's that aspect of being culturally responsive that has that self-awareness component. Do we really understand how we show up? in the room and whether or not our own cultural lens either supports relationship building with students or hinders relationship building with students because we know no learning takes place minus a significant relationship so that is what culturally responsive teaching really is all about how do we use who students are and what they bring with them 
to leverage their learning? And how do we support our staff in really understanding our students beyond academic measures? That is what culturally responsive teaching is all about. You'll hear lots of other things, but at its core, that's what it is. Family and community engagement, I am very happy to say, and Katie, you'll know this well, one of my jobs used to be family and community engagement on top of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And we've recently hired and invested in a family and community engagement manager who will now work with our district to create a framework for all schools to use in engaging with our family and our community in positive ways. We have 31, I think, family liaisons now across our district in various schools. So they support that work. And we have a new person, Stancy Sykes, who is doing that work in our district and I'm very happy because she takes a load off of me as well. Cheryl, the next piece. Fiscal equity. So I mentioned that we have a, a finance office that oversees all of the dollars uh, and cents coming into our district. Recently, um, because of the Recovery Act funds that many organizations are receiving, including governmental and intergovernmental like ourselves, we have the opportunity to support students in ways that we haven't before. Um, and so when we look at uh, flipping our district to 100 percent remote last year. Um, that took an incredible amount of fiscal equity. And one of the ways that we addressed it was, first of all, 100% of our APS students have a Chromebook. 100% of them from K through 12 have a Chromebook provided by the district, supported by the district. And then the question became, well, what about Wi-Fi? Yeah, that would have been an inequity, right? Not everybody has access to Wi-Fi in their home. So what did we do? We bought hotspots. We bought hotspots for anyone that needed them in our district, distributed them last year. We delivered home book, uh, Chromebooks by uh, car uh, to our families in their homes, utilizing our security team members. And so fiscal equity is a really important aspect of comprehensive educational equity as well. Um, we can talk a little bit about student-centered learning. It is connected to that culturally responsive teaching, really ensuring that we have student voice in everything that we do and that our decisions are driven by students at the center. Um, a lot of times, you know, we can get caught up in making decisions that work best for adults. Um, and so being equitable in that work, we wanna flip that lens and say, well, does this work for students first? Um, teacher quality, Access to teachers who are high quality and diverse is one of the challenges we are facing. Some of the things we are doing in that area, because believe it or not, there aren't a lot of people going into education for lots of different reasons, but not a lot of diverse candidates either. And so one of the things we're doing is looking at alternative opportunities, alternative pathways, to teach your licensure. So if you have been a chemist for Goodyear um, and desire to now become a teacher, we wouldn't necessarily want you to spend, you know, an additional four years to go back to college and um, receive a, a teaching degree and licensure. We want to look at alternative routes to support that passion and move you into education at a much quicker path than the traditional route. So those are some of the things we're doing. Um, you may have heard from past superintendent state of the school addresses around our equitable student access. So things like ensuring that all of our students at every grade level have access to field trips. Um, and so the GAR 
foundation funding our essential experiences all students having access to the zoo and the akron art museum which was mentioned earlier hell farm and village and other cultural outlets so that we aren't dependent on families who may have limited resources to create those learning opportunities for their students. We are providing access in unique and different ways now to ensure that all students have the opportunity to access um, equitable learning opportunities. And sure, I think there might be one or two more others. Yeah. We talked about diverse staff and the alternative pathway and then school climate, the final one I wanted to talk about. When we're talking about school climate, we're really talking about how are we creating the type of environments that support students socially and emotionally, and then how do we engage with our families so that they are welcome uh, they are connected to the resources that they need. And all of these things together make up what we call comprehensive educational equity. Now, our superintendent is going to be creating a very diverse team of staff, of teachers, of administrators, and some community uh, stakeholders to help us create a district-wide strategic plan um, that would identify those areas of focus because we can't do all of this at one time. We need to identify where we're going to place our focus within the next couple of years and then move strategically toward what types of actions and goals we might have around each of these at, in the coming years. So Steve, I see your question. How are current teachers holding up with the ever moving target of in-person classes and virtual training and the extra responsibilities? So yeah, um, if you know an educator, you know that this has been an incredibly hard um, and tough uh, year and a half. Um, I have to give kudos to our teaching staff who flipped on a dime last year and went 100% remote. Um, it is very challenging. It is very difficult. I, I, I will tell you that um, this time last year, having conversations with teachers about the, the whole virtual world of education in an environment where many of our young people, you know, don't have the type of, of supports to thrive. And then on the flip side of that, there were students who also thrived in that environment. But I'll tell you what has happened. Education will never be the same, right? as a result of uh, the pandemic. We'll always now and probably forever, I've heard our leadership say, have a remote option uh, for families. Um, and so while we are coming back in person, fully masked, regardless of your vaccination status, we still have that remote learning option available. And I think many teachers are, are happy to have their students back in the classroom because, you know, with the virtual learning, there were so many variables, right, that have uh, affected their ability to teach. And I, I'll tell you, for the first time in my career, I've heard that people are leaving the profession due to the stress. Doug, well, you have other questions? Yes, uh, so as the greeter today, I have the honor of uh, fielding a few questions that came through the uh, chat, Carla. Um, there was a question that came through that asked, uh, how do people learn more about the alternative licensure program? We have a point person in our human resources office who will be managing that work. Her name is Angela Harper. But you can dial our 
1661 number, get connected to human resources, and they will put you in touch with the alternative pathway. So I have a personal connection there. Angela Harper is a rock star. Yeah. She, she was my grandson's principal at Mason Community Learning Center. And yeah. we will miss her, but stay connected. <laughs> yeah. So we, she's a good resource. Yeah. Excellent resource. Excellent resource. Uh, hey, any hey, other Doug. questions? No new ones in the chat room, but if there are other questions, let us know. Yeah, I was going to say if Carla can stay on for, let's say, another 10 minutes, I will officially end the meeting. And then for anybody that would want to stay and raise some of their questions, uh, would that work for you, Carla? Do you have an extra yeah, 10 sure. minutes? I have 10 okay. minutes, yes. Okay. Then at this time, I'm just going to officially call our meeting to an end. Uh, with the ringing of the bell. And uh, those of you that have to go, have a wonderful rest of your week. And those of you who would love to stay and carry on any questions with uh, Miss Carla, please stay by and Doug will MC the event. Carla, thanks so much for taking the time. It was a great presentation. Um, I know with Tim being on the state school board now and the responsibilities are different, he's getting inundated with thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of emails a week of regarding uh, this exact topic and people thinking it's just about one thing and not teaching through the lens of diversity of thought and income and, and the exact things you said. So I appreciate you sharing with that. I'd like to stay on, but um, we're coming back to Akron and I have to button up the campsite, which are words nobody ever thought they'd ever hear me say two years ago. So. <laughs> Safe travels back, say, Katie. Thanks. Carla, I had a question. Um, in my previous life, before I retired, um, my agency ended up having a diversity, uh, cultural diversity committee that actually went on for about three years. It was still going on when I retired. Um, but it was interesting. We tried to make it as diverse as possible, but we really had a number of people that dropped off because of their level of uncomfortableness with some of the topics we talked. But the other thing, and I'm curious how you might address it. You know, like you said, a lot of times it started out as a race related type of thing. And we had a number of individuals that were African-American that really felt offended because we weren't spending enough time on race. And so how do you address that topic from the standpoint that it is more about diversity and race is an important part of that, but how do you help people to see that is a diverse world in general like that. I wish I would have had that table graph that you had because it was perfect from an education standpoint. Yeah, so honestly, um, foundational understanding, common language is really important in this work, right? We, even in the school district, we're, we're at the stage of foundational understanding and getting to common language. And then once we do that, you can take it to level two, if you will, and start to talk about intersectionality. And that's where I started to uh, at least introduce the idea of drawing the lines, right? Between the intersections. And that's where you really dive into race because it is very difficult to talk about diversity without also talking about race. But until we get to a foundational understanding, it's hard for us to jump it right into race because you get the discomfort. You get, you get people who are going to interpret things in a different way. Um, I like to start with that foundational understanding. And as we move, to conversations around equity and then inclusion, we have to talk about race. You have to, you can't talk about equity without talking about race. But if you jump to it without developing that foundational understanding and level of comfort, it's really difficult to do. And then the other thing is the skill in having the conversation it is that it's a skill um, and it has to be facilitated in a way that opens one up to uh, a mindset 
a mindset and then grows that awareness and deepens that knowledge and understanding over time because everybody's at a different place. And I think we, we've, we got there, but it, it was interesting. Some of the people that left because they felt so uncomfortable, they really were the ones that needed to be there as well. But, mm -hmm. um, but we always kept the door open, but not too many came back. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's a journey. Right. It's a journey. And, and I always say that you, we're going to have those ebbs and flows with people. Um, and I'm always looking for the allies. Um, there are some folks who are going to hear information best from others. Right. And finding who those folks are is important, too. All right. Thanks. And uh, Carl, I brought up that question about teachers and you also in your presentation there, uh, you were talking about them and how hard it is to find the folks that fit what you're looking for. Um, I have a significant concern because I have a number of teachers that I know that are friends. And I'm just wondering if they're gonna be able to hold up with, in one sense, having to make more bricks with less straw. And uh, I just don't know, I just don't know how, for instance, that those who are in positions of leadership and administration are going to wrestle with all of this because uh, as you mentioned, there are a lot of people that are leaving the profession because they're highly discouraged and um, they, don't, they don't feel as if they can keep up with uh, what's being expected of them. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of that was even in place before COVID, right? Before the pandemic, uh, the pressures and stress of teaching and the expectation and the test scores and you know all of that. Um, what I will say I'm most proud of here in Akron, though, is that when we got through 2020, it then gave us a chance to look at, you know, really some of the things that were innovative during 2020, we need to memorialize, right, and, and, and expand and do more of. So one of the things around, I mentioned remote learning. Rather than our teachers having to deal with remote learning and in-person students, right, which is almost double whammy, we now have a remote learning section of our wow. district that is manned by educators who will support Fabulous. those students and then make those connections back to their teachers if necessary in homerooms at that secondary level or elementary level for additional supports. That came right out of the pandemic. Wow. You know, that, that came out of the pandemic. Another uh, best practice that I think came out of the pandemic was we had all these all of our uh, staff persons who um, bus drivers, um, secretaries, um, support people who were not directly engaged in day to day teaching. We flipped them to new roles. Mm -hmm. So they became people who were connectors who made calls to families just to check on the status of students Fabulous. So that they're okay, you know? And we were using buses to deliver um, things for our students and our safety team and, you know, lunch, grab and go lunch didn't just uh, happen with our lunch ladies or men anymore. It was everybody hands on deck who had a new role now in the district. So some of that, I think we just, probably need to look at ways to better utilize the folks we have. That's outstanding and that's uh, amazingly creative on your parts. Hey, just stepping sideways into the personal realm and Cheryl had given me a lot of good information on you with that resume. Uh, I saw from your involvement in knowing uh, your history in basketball that you coached a men's basketball team and I'd like to know who you coached and how you actually did with that. Well, uh, Cheryl has probably heard this before. It was Garfield High School. My alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> and now I will tell you, Steve, that it was not the best thing I've ever done, but someone had to do it. <laughs> and I will tell you that um, I was shocked. 
And that would have been, oh, 2004 or five, I'm thinking, wow. um, for a couple of years. And I was shocked at the lack of readiness among the sports arena for a female coaching males. I, I you know, you think 20, we're in the 21st century and everybody's ready for this, but mm -mm. Uh, it was very difficult, but I'm glad that I did it and stuck it out, but it was very difficult. We still have a way to go on gender equity. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right? Across many things, pay and position and mm -hmm. yeah, and I experienced it. Mm. Yeah, I experienced it. Well, you were a forerunner. You were ahead yeah. of your time if you were coaching back then. You were well, way ahead of your happening. time. We have females in the NFL, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening right now. But I, you know, it would be interesting to get a roundtable on their experience. What What year was that, Carla, that you coached? Oh gosh, Doug, I'm thinking that was 2005 ish. Yeah, like seven or eight. It was way back. It's been a while yeah. now. That's there's, yeah. there's, well. Hopefully, we've made some steps forward, but yeah, it's yeah. Um, it's it's hard. Yeah. Well, one of the things we know is important in this work is to be data driven. And so if yes. we're, we're going to have those discussions around gender equity, we should be getting people in, in positions that have a, a real boots on the ground knowledge, right? And, and finding out what's happening with their experiences. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing with us. What uh, what you brought was uh, outstanding. The uh, the diagram, the first diagram, I mean, blew my mind how broad and how deep diversity actually uh, goes. And so that was very enlightening. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It was a joy to see you again, Carla, as always. Yeah. Good to see thank you, Carla. You. Bye, Dad. Hey, God bless. Have a Bye. good rest of your week. Have a great day, Thank everybody. You. Make it All a great right. day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.